that really we all need to pay attention to because suicide is what the 10th leading cause of death in this country and people don't ever talk about it much the media don't talk about it if somebody in the community commits suicide we in the media don't talk about it unless it's a huge prominent figure yet this just goes on and on and on and on so uh, I have a I have a guest who's joining us right now. Her name is Vita Kowalski. She's from the Interfaith Community Services Mental uh, Health uh, Excuse me Interfaith Community Community Services Organization, which does does all kinds of outreach for the community. But among them is they do mental health outreach, and uh, Vita is their mental health outreach specialist. So thanks for joining us this morning, Vita. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you coming on because I, I want to. You know, it's it's it sounds kind of callous i guess to say it but you know you hope that we can learn something from what happened to robin williams and and what Mm -hmm. i would like to to share with the tucson and southern arizona community this morning is just number one uh, how do you how do you know if someone's in trouble i mean are there warning signs that are that would indicate what i would call a clear and present danger i mean how can you figure out if someone's really suffering from the uh, an illness that or a problem that might lead to suicidal tendencies as opposed to just run-of-the-mill Monday blahs. Well, and I'm glad that you brought up that distinction. Um, There is a difference between, you know, feeling um, depressed, feeling unhappy, you know, having those those blues. Every all of us get those, you know, from time to time. But when we're talking about um, clinical depression, we're talking about something that um, clinically um, lasts for more than two weeks, and it impacts our ability to. live in this world, our ability to maintain social relationships, our ability to go to work, um, that's when you know you're looking at a uh, disorder as opposed to just the normal blues that we may have from time to time. So if someone fear- appears to be physically debilitated in the sense that they, they can't get themselves out of bed or they can't, Correct. they don't want to go they to can't. work and they don't take, they don't seem to want to take part in any of life's normal activities, that's when you know that's- that there's an issue. That's correct, and that's with um, really basically any um, mental disorder, not just depression. Sure. You see that break. For someone to be suffering from serious depression, depression that could lead to something tragic, uh, is it normal for them to express what's called suicidal ideation? I mean, do they talk about those kinds of things? Is that going to be one of the signs, or can it sneak up on you and have something like that happen without you even knowing there was the danger? One thing I want to say is, is that um, not all people who um, suffer from depression will be suicidal. Um, But for those who do, um, there may be signs um, which, you know, they may talk about it, they may write about it, um, they might start, um, you know, giving away things. Um, What you're going to see is a drastic change in behavior of that person who become suicidal, you'll see that um, they'll start gathering things um, in order to carry out the particular activity. But one thing is, is that you won't know about that suicidal behavior in most cases unless you actively talk with the person about it. And one of the myths in our society is, is that if we talk to a person about suicidal behavior, then we have created that thought in their mind. And that's absolutely not true. To talk about it is actually actually a very um, empowering moment for that person to be able to release and talk about what's going on with them. And that's the best thing we could probably do with a person who's suicidal. Okay, so you're not going to plant the thought in their head, and you're not going to glamorize it for them, and you're not going to make them think that, you know what, maybe this is a good thing. The best thing to do is to talk about it, get it out on the table, and deal with it. Right, because then it gives you the information that will help you get them the help that they need. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. If you have a loved one, and you're starting to see some of these signs, if uh, they're, maybe their 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 work performance is deteriorating badly, or they don't want to go to work, they start they you know they they seems it seems like all the joy is leached out of their lives, uh, they're just not participating in life like they did, and you're really really worried about it. What should you do? 
There's a number of resources here in Tucson. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud uh, to live in Tucson because we have a wealth of agencies and services that are available to us. First and foremost, if you are um, with someone who is actively suicidal, the thing to do is to call 911. And when you call 911, you let the operator know that this is a mental health emergency so that when law enforcement comes out, they have a specifically trained team who can come out and address um, that situation. Um, there is a crisis hotline that's available to all of us. That number is 520-622-6000 to call when we do have a concern about someone um, who is really depressed, who we think might be suicidal. Um, you can call that number or that person. The person who is feeling um, unsafe can also call that number as well. So if I just say that, I, that I'm the person that's having the suicidal thoughts or I'm severely depressed and I just I'm looking for answers. Uh, mm-hmm. Do the crisis hotlines work? Uh, tell me how those tell me how those uh, that conversation is likely to go and what will happen a, as the outcome of that conversation. I mean, I know these uh, I have heard of success stories, but tell me crisis- what, what 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 I could expect if I call such a hotline. The crisis hotline is staffed with people who have been specifically trained to deal with crisis situations. So they're going to talk with that person about what's going on. They're going to go through an assessment protocol to determine um, the lethality of the situation. So they will be making decisions about whether or not they're going to be calling someone to come out and assess that person, whether they're going to be calling 911, whether they're going to be giving that person information for them to follow through with seeking help on their own. So they will be making the assessment of what the next steps will be for that person. And oftentimes, too, they serve to give um, information to, if you're calling about someone else, they also are a good source of information to talk through with that person what their next steps are in helping an individual. Let's talk a little bit about uh, teens. Uh, It's a sort of a a unique subset of problems, and I I experienced this myself when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. I I really struggled with with teen depression, and I, I discovered firsthand that mental anguish can be uh, much more terrifying and much harder to deal with than physical anguish. I've, I've had both. When I've had a kidney stone, which a lot of people have described as the, about the most painful experience you can go through. Even women who've, who've, had, who've had gone through childbirth say kidney stones are more painful. And that's nothing compared to the mental anguish I went through as a teen. So talk to me a little bit about the special and unique problems and circumstances of, of teen depression. Well, you know, oftentimes the signs and symptoms of of depression for teens and for adults are um, somewhat um, very similar. I think that what we miss with teens often in terms of our diagnosis or follow-up with them is that we sometimes just want to dismiss that what they're going through is just being a teenager. But oftentimes that is not the case. Oftentimes we miss a diagnosis of depression um, because um, we think it's just an age thing, and it really isn't. So we want to look at things like uh, changes in weight loss and and um, whether it's um, gaining weight, losing weight, um, you know, loss of pleasure, of interest in activities. You'll see a lot of risk-taking amongst um, youth, um, which might be an indicator of uh, depression, um, difficulty in concentrating. You'll see that breakup in their relationships. Um, so some very similar, similar symptoms that you'll see with adults as well. And, and um, also, too, I want to talk about self-medicating, um, which is another symptom um, to look at when you're looking at clinical uh, depression. It's a way of masking the pain of getting into abusing the alcohol and the drugs. We want to watch for that as well. Let's talk a little bit about that because we know, for instance, Robin Williams, the person whose death has sparked this conversation, suffered with those kinds of things. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking, oh, you know, you're messed up because you're on drugs and alcohol. Right. Isn't it sometimes the other way around? Your 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 mental issues and your your emotional anguish leads you to seek that kind of outlet. Well, it's it's a symptom. Um, the the abusing the alcohol and the drugs could be um, an actual symptom of what's going on with that person. If you're not seeking treatment, if you're if you're if you don't have any way of letting go that pain and that angst 
and instead you're seeking the the alcohol, the drugs, um, as a way of getting through the day, as a way of getting through the pain, um, that's something that you do want to address. Now, I know one thing that uh, comes up a lot when you're discussing mental health issues is the whole idea of the mental health stigma. And somebody's trying to uh, work their way through these problems, and there's a barrier between them and help in the form of, I don't want to be thought of as someone who had to reach out for this kind of help. Or if you're their loved one, you know, I don't want to, to go there because I don't want my loved one to be thought of as someone who had to be helped in this fashion. So how do you push through that? What advice do you can you give people uh, if you're going through this yourself with depression or if you have a loved one who is? How do you push past that worry and that thought that there might be a stigma attached to get the help that you need? Well, I think there's a, a number of things. I, you know, to have to be in the moment with people and to listen to them non-judgmentally and and to show empathy and care and concern and let them know that you know most of the mental disorders are treatable, just as any physical disease. Um, you know, most of them are treatable. And so, you know, I say to people, you know, when you get a cut, um, you know, you put a Band-Aid on it. You do something, you know, to, to treat it. And so the same thing should be with um, a mental disorder. Um, we have, well, not, not me personally, but in the medical field, there are ways of treating certain disorders, whether it's, it's through uh, medicine, whether it's through uh, cognitive behavioral um, you know, types of um, um, therapies, but there are ways of treating what is going on with that person. We want to let them know that it's okay. Last question I want to ask you is um, talk to me a little bit about how mental health outreach became a mission of uh, Interfaith Community Services. What is it that uh, your organization is trying to do and what kind of success are you seeing? Well, you know, about four years ago, um, ICS saw a need within the faith communities to um, really address and look at um, mental health issues. What had happened is that um, clergy and lay leaders were asking the question, what can we do? How do we meet the needs of, of our congregation members who may have mental health disorders? What do we do? And so ICS wanted to bridge that gap. ICS wanted to uh, connect with our faith communities and offer them educational programs and services that would help clergy and lay leaders address that within their congregation. So that's why we have a mental illness conference that we do every um, two years. Um, we invite um, uh, professionals within the field to come in and share their expertise with uh, lay leaders and clergy and just individuals out in the community who want to know more about um, mental illness. We have uh, lunch and learns. They are more focused, um, finite um, set of time in which we focus on a specific issue um, regarding mental illness. And then we also have basic training for our congregational health leaders. So we have a number of workshops shops um, that are available. I am a um, certified trainer for Mental Health First Aid USA, so I specifically go out into the uh, faith communities and present an eight-hour workshop on various, the more common mental health disorders that we will see, so the depression, anxiety, some psychoses. Um, we talk about suicide and how to talk to someone who may be suicidal. Um, so we have a lot to offer um, our community. Now, somebody would like to inquire about these services or perhaps would like to donate and help ICS in its cause, what would be the number to call? The number to call would be uh, 297 6049. 297-6049. Yes. Vita Kowalski with ICS, thank you so much for being on this uh, with us this morning. Appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise. Thank you.